Nancy, it, it's a pleasure to meet you here. I, I know you. this is a, you know, kind of jumping on video conference and everything, but I'm, I'm very excited. You are absolutely the first mediator that I have spoken with. Mm -hmm. And I think to great degree, uh, the Deadbeat Chronicles and its intent, along with its knowledge and it, its experience, and that's me, right? Right. Um, the whole darn system needs reform. And I know that's ambiguous, but the whole darn system does. And by the system being an awful lot of things before anyone ever considers getting married, <laughs> an awful lot of uh, an awful lot of virtue is missing from uh, teaching our kids at the elementary, junior, and high school levels and all kinds of things. And I don't mean to just to keep you know, just diving in and r rambling in. Uh, I would really like to have you kind of take over here, Nancy. And how did you get into mediation? And what is mediation really all about? Okay, good questions. Um I got into mediation um, after my husband died unexpectedly, and 30 days later, my stepdaughter, who I thought I had a good relationship with, who worked with her dad, sued me in probate court for my share of the family business. And I was in intense grieving, actually for a year, and found myself having to defend a lawsuit um, that cost me over $80,000 that I couldn't afford in attorney's fees before we ultimately settled out of court. And I have long since forgiven her. I understand why she did what she did. I have no relationship with her, nor do I have a desire to. But after I started feeling more like myself again, I literally sat down at my computer and Googled how do families resolve conflict? And the word mediation came up. And it was a total light bulb moment for me. I started my training in 2010, got my, did my internship in 2011, <clears throat> and got my divorce certification in January of 2012. And I opened my doors and I have been mediating divorce and family and custody and business issues ever since. Um, it's the perfect fit for me. My background is law. I was a paralegal for decades and a certified legal administrator. And so that part, understanding like how to write a document and such was second nature to me. Um, but it turns out that mediation is a perfect fit for me because as a mediator, I am a neutral third party. And by nature, I'm non-judgmental. So that's what a mediator does. I sit with people in conflict and I help them come to their own resolution. And I'm going to say that again for you, Jeff, because that's the key to mediation. I don't tell my clients what to do. They come up with their own solutions because who can better decide what's best for their family than the members of the family or the decision makers in the family? I agree. Uh, I, I wholeheartedly believe that the respect and reverence and authority for all families should be under their own roof and not in the power of any other movement or entity, call it the state or even social media, entertainment, society, exactly. you know, and, and things like that. But, and, and I asked this almost the same exact question on a, on a previous uh, podcast, what happens when that doesn't go right though? What, what happens when you have one or even both parties that you're trying to help work through some really emotionally delicate issues and there's ego involved and narcissism in, involved. Let, let's go right to the heart of the matter. I mean, you, you've got some hurt feelings that are, I think are very valid. And then you have some reactions that some people have, some very harsh responses, very selfish responses. There's a lot, Nancy, you, I'm preaching to the choir, aren't I? Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of destruction, tremendous amount of destruction. And then the kids, Everyone yeah. says that, oh, the kids get destroyed. Oh, the kids get taken from. Oh, the kids get this and the kids are abused like this and they're affected like that. And, but, but what are we really doing about it from a proactive point of view? Everything to me seems very reactive right. in our mechanisms and our courts and our. Right, right, exactly. Well, a lot of, I have so many answers to that. First of all, when I am interviewing prospective clients and they're interviewing me, one of the first things I say is, 
if you feel like you need to be right, mediation won't be a good fit for you. You, you better roll the dice and let a judge decide. But Oof. I also say, do you want a, a judge to decide what's best for your family when the judge has never met your family? And sometimes, oftentimes, I ask my clients during the mediation process, show me pictures of your kids. And what that does is that gets them off of their position and they're scrolling through their phones and they're showing me and they're showing each other. And I don't have to remind them this is about the kids. They get it just by looking at the pictures and sharing the pictures with me. I am all about advocating for the kids because they don't have a voice in this. And, and of course, I'm mostly dealing with the end of a relationship. But right. what I strongly feel is that kids pattern their behavior by what they observe at home. And I know in my relationship, 100%. I observed my, my parents were married 64 years when my dad died. And Jeff, they bickered every single day, but then they kissed and made up. And I thought when I got married for the first time that bickering was how you related to a spouse. That was what I learned at home. Turns out that didn't work for me. So I remind my clients that that their kids, even if they're babies and toddlers, are picking things up. And I tell them, it's important for your kids to know that conflict exists. That's reality. But it's more important for your kids to see that conflict can get resolved. And it can get resolved with dignity and respect and affection. You know, you say that most of your clients get to you on the back end. Yeah. They're, they're, they're on the way out. Uh, yeah. How do we get you specifically? How do we get you on the front side of a relationship? How do we get you having all the conversations that you have in, in, in negotiating compromises? How yeah. do we get all of the, that exact same message in a proactive arena? How, how, if the governments or the systems, if the systems and procedures are forcing moms and dads and even kids and even extended family to act in certain ways and to completely reveal themselves with their assets and other 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 things if we're if we're for and we are we mm -hmm. as, a, as a nation and or our procedures right our society and the way we think we're forcing people to do things then i'd submit to you how why can we not force nancy gabriel's curriculum for lack of a better term uh -huh, uh -huh. into the processes of school districts into yeah. the curriculum or the procedures of society and social media and i feel like i'm forgetting a niche there but all of that messaging right it it, it seems like it's all against the success of the family it it's is. all reactive and how do so how do we get nancy gabriel proactive how do we do and that's a real question i don't know how to do it but i'm certainly yeah, trying to find I out mean, you know, sometimes I do um, what I call business prenups. Um, I, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not qualified to cre create a, a an ironclad prenuptial agreement. But what I would suggest in that context and in the context of a business prenup, I'm sitting down with people who are intending to go into business with one another and doing the what ifs. And how are you going to communicate? And when are you going to respond? And what what are what's your skill set versus what your partner's skill set why can't we do that with divorce with couples getting married and anticipate exactly what why happens can't we? when you have children who's going to be the the disneyland parent and who's going to be the disciplinarian good cop bad cop however you want to word it and let's um talk about your conflict resolution skills and maybe I can help in that front end in giving you some tools to resolve a conflict so that neither of you feels like you've caved, so that also neither of you feels like you've won, but that you've come to a resolution and a compromise. And that's the what you would demonstrate to your kids. Mutually coming to that compromise. Yeah. And presenting that mutually to the kids. Uh, there's a name, uh, Nancy, I don't know if you've got a the ability to write down on, on a quick note sticky. I absolutely want to introduce you to a gal by the name, superwoman, by the name of Rosalind Sadaka. And she lives in West Palm Beach, Florida. And she created years ago, 30 years ago, she created the Child-Centered Divorce Organization. 
and it's all her. She's got a couple of uh, books and she's got an awful lot of uh, content on the different news channels and podcasts. And um, so, yeah, I, I, any resource, any resource that I can help put together your organization, an organization like hers. I, I'm sure you've spoken with many divorce coaches and uh, uh, divorce counselors. Yes. I, before taking this deep dive over the past eight, nine weeks, Nancy, I had never heard of a divorce counselor. And my first thought about that industry, let's call it an industry, was, and I'll take responsibility for this, it was a bit assumptive and reactive. And I thought, oh, well, that sounds, that's just a Band-Aid. And that, that's an industry that's leveraging itself so off the backs of the failures of the American marriage. Not true. Not true. They are very frustrated with the powers that be, with the mechanisms that be in, in divorce. And they're very proactive thinking into self-responsibility and I'll, I'll, I'll use this phrase, ego death. Me, I'm talking with Rosalind, you know, she talks about, again, the words child-centered divorce. Right. Well, if the child's in first place, then it puts the ego of mom and dad in second, third position. And just inherently, that makes sense, right? And yeah. I, I have been through divorce myself and, and uh, in a strange situation with my own kids. I have obviously not done it right. I would like to think that all the responsibility is not on me for the some of those current situations with with family with right. me. Right. So uh, I've also got another dynamic family dynamic that I have lived for over ten years myself with my current wife and my two stepsons, the extended family and those relationships, and very on the on this on the pendulum of extremes. I've got mm -hmm. one dynamic that is on one side and very full of resentment and distrust and hurt feelings. And again, separation and estrangement. Mm -hmm. well, that separation and, and estrangement definitely comes with mental anguish, mental, potentially emotional abuse. Uh, and again, that's a, that's a whole set of episodes for, for a different day. Yeah. But yeah. But again, they're getting the Nancys, getting the Rosalinds. Uh, and I want to mention another name, Kirsty Jane. That, scribble that name down, Kirsty Jane. She is a Brit that has lived in Quebec for, or, or Calgary, I think, for the past 22 years and has gone through divorce. She has a wonderful uh, partner. I, I would like to thank fiance. I, I think, I hope. He lives in Phoenix. So they're like the international Brady Bunch, yeah, and yeah. they're making it work, and they understand things. So, so I, it all. Well, and stems that's an avenue I think we could explore, Jeff, about um, blended families because statistically, second marriages fail more frequently than first marriages, and a lot really? of times it's because of of the of the blended family situation. And I have done many mediations with blended families where I have given. 10-year-olds a voice and written contracts that 10-year-olds sign, which of course are not legally binding, but in their mind, they're feeling valued. And a another thing that- um, and, and and declaration and commitment, De de making declarations and commitments. Yeah. Our word is our bond. And yeah. I can't tell you how many frustrations I have on the, on the, let's say the occupational level. My nine to five, I'm in custom design on- on swimming pools, custom design and build on, uh, you know, swimming pools here in uh -huh. Las Vegas and uh -huh. or Southern Nevada. And, and, uh, the, the professional side of things, the personal side of things, the family side of things, uh, I have a place in my life with nonprofit in some of the commitments we deal with people all the time. Everyone, every person we have in our lives is a relationship, right? Right. right. Sometimes people follow up on their word and sometimes people don't. And so where, where does that come in when, when yeah. you're trying to bring two people to the table and, and you may be on the pendulum of total control freak narcissism all the way to someone that just doesn't follow up on their word? How is it the leading a horse to water and you can't make them drink theory there? Kind of. Or can you help people work through that and improve? I, I, I have 
techniques and strategies to help people work through it. Most definitely. Um, I just I, pictured you like, with it, having someone in a headlock. I have my techniques. I had picture you having someone in a headlock. Make do what I say. Er. When, when <laughs> you see me in person, you'll realize I'm the least intimidating person you've ever seen. I'm five feet tall. I'm tiny. You know, I smile a lot. But nevertheless, I can get my point across. I, can, I just do it nicely, you know. Um, one other thing I wanted to, uh, two things. One is with regard to that, when I am retained by my clients, I send them an agreement to mediate and there's an exhibit to that. And I call it the behave yourself exhibit. And it's saying that they're agreeing not to do bad things to one another or not to bad mouth each other in front of the kids and all like that. And then at the end, when my, um, my work is done with them and I, I send them off into the sunset, I, I have a document that I created called the Co-Parenting Bill of Rights. And it's based on the Bill of Rights of the U.S. Constitution, the first 10 amendments. And sure. I have them read it. I suggest that they read it out loud to their kids and sign it and put it on the refrigerator or wherever. And um, it, also, depending on the age of the kids, it's all about respect. It's all about communication. And it's all about you know moving forward in a in a dignified and and a, a, a kid forward manner. So you know I do with I deal with a lot of narcissists. I deal with a lot of emotionally drained or abused spouses. I'm not going to say wives or husbands. It's pretty much equal. Um, and sometimes the system favors the dads. And sometimes the system favors the moms. You talk about a pendulum. I've been in this for 12 years. I've seen it swing, in, at least in Nevada, in both directions. And okay. often, all the time, actually, I tell my clients, if you go to trial, first of all, it's going to cost you a ton of money. But secondly, it's kind of going to depend on what the judge ate for breakfast. It's that arbitrary. Mm -hmm. And so I get people who've been to court and then come to me and say, why didn't we go to you first? You know, and sometimes I meet with them privately. Sometimes I have people in conflict who can't be in the same room with one another. And I do what's called shuttle mediation, where uh, as the mediator, I shuttle back and forth. But I love your concept about, about heading this off at the pass. And, you know, we, we have to go to driver's training or driver's education before we get a driver's license. Why can't we create that same sort of curriculum, to use your words, for people contemplating marriage or remarriage? And, why are, and, and, and let's ask why all over the board. Why are we talking about this in 2023 to me, which seems like a little bit more? But then I have a conversation with Rosalind Sedeca who created child-centered divorce and she went through her own divorce situation with a, a, a son, a single boy, you know, no brothers and sisters. And that came out very successful. And even her son talks about it in, in, within the family about how he, his mom and his dad going through their divorce really did it right. Rosalind talks about dancing with her ex-husband at their son's wedding, which is the, if, if there's ever kind of something uh, that would demonstrate success, that's certainly it. Sure, sure, right? 100%. So, yeah. Um, the intent of the Deadbeat Chronicles podcast is very much to, like we keep asking, how do we get in front of this? How do we get your messaging and so much other very positive, healthy brain food messaging into our society at all age groups, at all generations. Obviously, the approach into me, 53-year-old guy, is going to be different in, than into a 12-year-old student in junior high school. Yeah. Um, but those are the formative years. What are we doing with our children in these formative years? And I say our children. Who's our children? from coast to coast, Alaska, Hawaii, and all the territories, and even internationally, it's our babies. Yeah, It's our babies, our kids. Yeah. My About three and a half weeks ago, my mom asked me, hey, Jeff, do you think you're going to run out of content for the show? And I, I said, absolutely not, mom. We're raising babies, and we should continue to raise babies. Yeah. Let's talk I about that for a second. I think there should be some education, maybe starting in middle school about, and this is, of course, my wheelhouse, about conflict resolution 
And rather than centering it on babies or, or child rearing or anything like that, about relationships, because that's what everything starts with is the relationship. So how do you navigate a relationship so that by the time you're ready to bring children into the world, you have a healthy respect for one another and you're pretty much on the same page in terms of your values moving forward. That would be a great place to start in, in I think, in middle school. I you know, do when too. I was in med middle school, we took home ec, like cooking and sewing. You know, how important is that it, it, or, it, rather than navigating relationships or as opposed to navigating relationships, you know? Well, and I was talking with uh, a guidance counselor for Clark County School District, and they brought up the humanities, the putting humanities type curriculum into other things or younger ages, right? Junior high school. And um, let me say that a different way, creating that curriculum for those age groups, you know, humanities, that's pretty deep and you know it gets into some stuff that the average 12 year old probably doesn't give beans about it's so also how do you, broad it, very broad right very broad so so having a 12 year old try to reach that thirty thousand foot level while they're right. learning something learning you know you and i are talking with years of experience i'd like to think we're mature we're probably so childish aren't we but i'd like to think that you know we're coming at this from a mature right slightly <laughs> wait till we wait till we get off of this very mature podcast and we start yes absolutely. Telling jokes. absolutely but but no i um also i do not have an acronym after my last name i don't have a degree that puts my messaging of just a an american dad with his own opinions into the school district environment right and i think the school district what do you what do you what what are your opinions of whether they're public schools and or private schools charters whatever what is your opinion of the curriculums or do you have an opinion about the curriculums I don't have that an are opinion. taught and 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 not taught you know yeah I don't have an opinion don't know i don't know what's being taught in schools these days honestly i live four do doors down from an elementary school i have friends who are educators but i've never had that conversation with them a good conversation right. to have well i i think it is because i think it applies to the overall broad using a term kind of that broad look resolution uh yeah. and resolution to what resolution to what i would call the the destruction of our american families from the inside out from some of the mechanisms some of the institutions some of the, all of the things that are pulling and tugging against the success of the American family. And, and, so and what's me, the definition of success? It means uh, so many family. different things to so many different families. Yeah, because let me ask you this, Jeff, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but Please do where, where, where are you basing the destruction um, of the American family on? Is it the nuclear families that we grew up in? Because I grew up in a nuclear family where my mom was a stay-at-home mom. My dad worked. I'm the youngest of three kids. It was a very traditional household. And my parents had a successful marriage, but families don't look like that anymore. So where's our, our norm? Where, where's, the baseline where's the baseline from which we, you know, we can uh, judge? I think the baseline is virtue. I think the baseline is intangible. I think the baselines, if plural, are... Um, integral i think they revolve around personal responsibility self-love um high levels of ownership confidence self-confidence high levels of self-esteem and i believe that we as humans commune so to have i'm very much into stoicism so when i look to the habits of let's say journaling in the morning in the evening and some meditation some deep thought about in internalizing things and realizing what I am in control of and what I'm not in control of. So in those arenas, uh, I think that, and you're going to kill me, ask that question one more. Oh, baseline, baseline. I, I yeah. think that that's the baseline. I, I think that the, the study and practices of virtue and then the common conversation about that within our families. 
And so, I think that's the common thread because whether it's a single mom, so we could go down the list, right? Single right. mom, single we dad, step parents. Oh my gosh. When, yeah. Um, when you say virtue though, that's subjective. I agree. You know, a self-love so, is, is a, a, a constant personal responsibility is a constant. I wrote down accountability. Um, I, I want to circle back to virtue, but I also want to add something to your list and that's respect. Mm -hmm. I think that's 100%. a very important baseline. I think respect, and I'll add another word, because I, I tend to couple these together. I think respect and reverence. Um, I got into an argument once with my previous relationship about reverence, and I was coming at reverence from a point of desire. You uh, reverence, you're looking up to something, you're looking up to a role model, therefore you're respecting it, and there's reverence there. And reverence come the argument coming in with me, at, at me was a, a very defiant, no reverence is defiant and telling and capturing and, you know, kind of this mindset of, Hey, let's be best friends with our kids instead of disciplinarian and holding the standard, holding the line. I don't believe that the line has been held for a great many years, probably two, three, four decades. There's a lot of disrespect, disrespect for institutions, um, disrespect for, uh, elders, uh, coaches, teachers go down the list. But I also think those institutions probably have fed into that as well. Right. Maybe the institutions aren't the best role models anymore. Sure. A little bit. Here. I mean, it's very complicated, right? It's totally complicated. Yeah. I mean, look at how much we revere a professional athlete versus an inspirational teacher or an actor. Or yeah, I mean it's just messed up. It's just mm -hmm. messed up. I I I'm I hear you. Um, uh, virtue and, and back to Divine back virtue. to uh, the the basics. Honesty. Do the right thing. Honesty, honesty, uh, integrity. You know, doing the right thing lies within the integrity sector. Um, Honesty is a behavioral personal choice. And let me say this, if there's ever an equalizing factor for every single human on this planet, regardless, and I really mean this, regardless of circumstance, it is the 24 hour day and the power to choose and the ability to choose. Now you might say, well, Jeff, that sounds awful arrogant. You're in America on a podcast with technology and a green screen and a fancy backdrop or a fancy, you know, digital little logo thing back there. Um, and when the podcast is over, you're going to go to your refrigerator and grab a Pepsi out of there and, you know, drink it or whatever. What about the person that's incarcerated? What about the person that's in another country and hasn't had water for 14 days? And you know, we could go on forever. I still would submit to you that unavoidably the 24 hour day is e equal when we have time to do, to make choices. So I'll leave it at that. Um, Integrity yeah. is hugely important to me. In fact, my last week's blog was about integrity. Um, I don't know if I mentioned to you that I write a weekly blog. It starts on my website and then I share it on social media. Um, I've been writing this weekly blog. It's a three minute read for seven years, more than seven years. And um, I never run out of topics because all of these Not things bad. that you're talking about, virtue and reverence can be separate um, conversations to be had. and and, you know, I love just spouting off my own opinion, but reaching out and getting the opinion of others who read, who read my blog. And, you know, these are interesting conversations. They're dynamic, they're changing, they're, and they're really important. So we're born into this world as, as, as people, there's no manual. There's no uh, owner's manual, like uh, going and buying a car. And uh, I'm probably going to turn into a broken record. I've probably done this on each pre-recorded cast. I break out this cell phone and I say, well, we're giving these to four-year-olds and say, here, go raise yourself with this. Yeah. And um, it's tough. So technological challenges, or, or, or let me say that a different way. The challenges that today's technologies present to families um, the continued conversation, the elevated and bolstered conversations uh, that we're having here um, are important. I sure. mean, if I could, if, if, uh, 
and again, that's what the show's about. You know, a lot of this recorded content, let's get it out there. Let's put it out there more and more and more and more with the kids. I, I would like to have a few episodes, if not many, with kids. Sure. With children of all walks of life and situations, failure, success, different economic statuses, different cultures, different zip codes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and things like that and, and get their take on it. I believe the kids absolutely should have a voice. I and do. I think and I think, you know, as, as we recognize what what's the voice of the children, I think put let's put you and I both at 17 years old and let's have this conversation at 17. In our defense, there's no way the depth of the conversation would be what it is right here. Right. Right. Of course not. But kids so how, are more sophisticated and they're more intelligent because their world's bigger than our worlds were at, at 17. I I agree to, I do agree to, to a certain degree. Uh, I also believe that nothing replaces experience, like nothing, Agreed. no matter what. In, in any walk of life or activity Agreed. or ability or pursuit. And so God bless them. I mean, yeah. the, I have a question for you, Jeff. Um, do you have examples of excellent parenting today at your disposal? I sure do. And Thank I you. sure do. And I'm Good. glad you asked that question. And some of my role models are, I'm so fortunate, are some of my best friends. Uh, uh, I'm not going to mention any names because the wife has already said, Jeff, no, God, my, no, I'm not going to get on the podcast. But I do think that she is a wonderful role model. She is the mother of five and successful marriage, obviously long-term marriage, five kids. I, the, the oldest is almost 23. Um, I love this family. I love Good. everything about it on so many macro and micro levels. I'm glad and, you have that. And, really and, and, uh, and and many more. I'm, I'm originally okay. from Southern California myself in, in a relatively small town, San Pedro, California. It's basically uh -huh. the Los Angeles Harbor. So lots right. of fishing, longshoremen and a bunch of other just great people. Some of my greatest memories. And I feel that I grew up in an arena and a town that had that standard. And we held that line. Were we perfect kids? Oh, my Jesus. Uh, what kid is uh, no we, we rambunctious and did a bunch of wild things but we were all in check you know using that that phrase hey you know check yourself yeah. keep in check i feel that way to this day i recently got married in uh, marianne and i my wife, we recently tied the knot officially this past november mm -hmm. and all of my groomsmen were every every single one of them are role models to me and some of them have uh, successful marriages. Some of them are maybe on their second marriage. They're all dads, every single one of them. And uh, I really look up to them. And I would say they are great successes, even past some failed relationships and, and they're raising wonderful. kids. On the, the parents maybe that are on the, um, that have had divorces, have excellent co-parenting examples for me. You know, and and I I, I want to take the opportunity to mention my wife Mary Ann. You say, is there a positive example? I have uh, dynamic examples of divorce. I have dynamic examples of let me let me start over. I've got dynamic examples of really hurtful divorces, and they will continue to be hurtful relationships because of the the dynamics of ego and resentment. And that just keeps carrying on, no matter how much someone might want to say, oh, you know, people have moved on and all these things. I'll take the opportunity to say this. My kids know that I love them very much and I, I want to be in their lives. I want them to be in my lives. So whatever's going on with them that's keeping that wall up, that's emotional damage. Or that, I don't mean to be a psychiatrist and this counselor and, and diagnosing, but that that's not good. And the longer it goes on, that's not good. But um, you realize it's not going to be, doesn't necessarily have to be forever either. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and that's a whole other podcast conversation, yeah, we'll, we'll right? We'll I talk mean, about all, that another time. <laughs> sure. Sure. That's all about keeping the door open. Right. And then 
living one's own life, living my own life the best that I can, being strict with myself. And am I perfect? No. And will my kids watch this podcast and be like, huh? Oh my God! If the 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 general public only knew what a jerk dad is, or or the, some of the jerk things that he has done, um, and that breaks my heart. But uh, going back to my wife Marianne, I'm going to get detailed about this because it's because it's honest. Um, it's true. The way that she handled the breakup and split with the fathers of my stepkids was in such a way that I have a good open communicative relationship with the both of them. They don't live in the Las Vegas area. When they come to Las Vegas, they're absolutely welcome to stay in this house instead of going spending money on an expensive Las Vegas hotel room. And also spend as much time with your kids as you possibly can. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, that for that is beyond a shadow of a doubt one of the reasons that I decided to put a ring on Marianne's finger. Can Absolutely. I ask a question, a burning question? No, because you've already asked too many. <laughs> I know, I do. It's my job. I'm kidding. I'm, <laughs> I'm totally kidding you. Ask him. But million. this one's important to me. <laughs> okay. More important I, than all the others. Why deadbeat? Where did you come up with that? And what does that mean to you? That's a great question. Um, back in 2009, 2010 area, I was uh, getting raked through the coals in chi in the child support arena. Not really family courts, but more so the child support arena. I was in a in real estate. It was 2006, seven, eight. The market had, you know, crashed, and I was reluctant to go into child support and or family courts to ask for a reduction in my child support based on my current income mm -hmm. so in that child support arena mm -hmm. i feel that they are very uh abrasive and aggressive against the non-custodial custodial parent the numbers by far had the the father in that non-custodial position but even I, I saw a couple of ladies up there in that non-custodial position position and and it's not a good place to be. Yeah. It is a very insulting, demeaning. Um, there is one currency that has value, and that is money. And there is no other currency that exists in that family court arena. I'm sorry, in, in the child support arena. Um, I, I don't believe the mechanisms of that body allow there to be a lot of levity there, either from the district attorneys that are there trying to collect for the not the custodial parent right but the bailiffs that are in the room and the they don't call it a judge forgive me i believe it's like a magistrate or, or something like that and then there's a clerk so the room the environment of the child support room is very much like a courtroom behind the bench or the area in the back there's there's seats for people to wait there and of course they're witnessing everything that's going on I had a couple of bad experiences there where I felt I felt lower than I had ever felt in my lower and more worthless than anything. And it didn't matter what came out of my mouth. It was a constant argument, put, put the non-custodial parent down, argument, put them down, argument, put them down, did not matter. Nothing mattered, but there was one gentleman this would have been sometime March of 2010. I um, was listening to a man say, hey, I, I shorted my child support for the month of December $200 to buy my daughter a Christmas gift. And the the magistrate came back and forgive me if I'm it's titling okay. I don't that. Know the right with, term. With, oh, with, 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 with all due respect to the, the their position, I know they worked hard to get there. And so the magistrate um, immediately came back and said, that's not your responsibility. You don't have the authority to do that. You give that full $200 payment or, or rather the full child support payment to your ex-wife and she can go ahead and get a Christmas present for you. And that's what did it for me. I felt that's, um, if, 
I, I'll, I'll take responsibility for this comment. If someone were to say a lot of these things to, to parents on the streets, in anywhere in the street, any, anywhere outside of the courtroom, it would be upsetting for most people to maybe some of the, sometimes that would be fighting words, maybe sometimes, you know, very insulting, very demeaning. So in that moment, I thought I need to write a book about this. I don't know anything about writing a book, but I, I need to write a book about this and I'm going to call it the Deadbeat Chronicles. That immediately. So you took a negative because deadbeat is most definitely a negative term and you're, it, you're, you're creating a positive result. Yes, I, I, that is the intent. And that's the, this may sound a little bit arrogant, but yes, that's the way it's going to be. Um, we can talk about all kinds of sensitive topics and hurt feelings and unpleasant experiences within breakups and splits and divorces and all these things. But I think it has to come with a direction of an intent of reform. I think it's yeah. got to be uh, reformative. I think it's got to be discussed and nothing hap I think that what's the show about? Let's talk about it. Let's yeah. talk about this. Let's talk about that. Uh, nothing starts without that. And then who are the directions and the people that we're going to talk to? Uh, I believe the Clark County Bar Association. I believe family law, family there's, judges. Yeah, there's a family law section uh, in, the, in the Bar Association. Oh, 100%. Um, and, yeah. and, and, you know, and the, so we, we could even devise a curriculum for the family law selection that section that um, would be, they would be afforded continuing education credits for taking this, this, you know, workshop or, or panel or whatever. Um, I'm all you know, for it. I, yeah. I, I'm, you know, with with my real estate background, I'm I'm familiar with real estate continuing education credits, and I've never done it myself, but I've I've known some title companies and mortgage lenders that have put together supportive continuing education classes for real estate brokers and agents. So, um, I'm sure that some of those processes to qualify a continuing sure. education course for and I have some connections at the state bar because I volunteer as a fee dispute mediator and arbitrator for the state bar. So I can certainly explore what it takes to put together a continuing education course and get it approved, market it. And, and, you know, that's getting the word out too. It's not monetized, but I don't care about that. I, you know, I, I like getting the message out. Guys, look, this may sound a little extreme, but if all of the directions keep going the way that it's going to go, the American family, that nuclear unit, uh, as defined the hundred different ways it should be defined and accepted is going to fall apart and get destroyed. And who gives a damn what gets monetized at that point? Right. Well, and uh, you know, it's politicized right now too. And that infuriates very. me. So, well, the school, you know, how much, so how much pushback is our, this type of messaging going to get at those mechanical levels, the school districts, the political arenas, the may, maybe courts, I, I'm very open-minded about approaching the courts and the child and uh, child support arenas because um, there's probably a lot of things and aspects and approaches, uh, a lot of nuance that, frankly, I don't understand yet. With all due respect to the law industry, lawyers, judges, clerks, procedures. Um, Nor do I, Jeff. I'm not a lawyer, and my yeah. clients don't go to court. That's my goal: is to keep them out of court. So right. I don't, I don't understand, you know, the mechanisms either, but, you know, certainly I have access to people who do. And I'd love, let me say this, I'd, I'd absolutely love multiple introductions, multiple discussions with the multiple different directions and relationships that you have. Um, 100%. Good. The, Good. the so, more, the more yeah. springboard relationships we can have these conversations with the better the the people mm -hmm. who what what are the entities right now that can affect change yeah the judges yeah. the assemblymen the council men and women the, the senators board. senators congressmen school board everyone who's around the kids yeah so yeah. what sort of pushback and i and i really do want to have respectfully members of the school board i would love to present to the Clark County uh, School Board 
Clark County District School Board. I would absolutely. I have a love former to. client who's a trustee, um, and I, I I had a very good experience with her. She had a good experience with me and her divorce, and um, you know I could certainly reach out to her. So you know, let's you and me put together some a task list, and and go from there. You want to uh, give me no. an assignment? Sure. No, I, I, I think, I think it's a great idea. Um, let's definitely expound on it, keep it going. And that would be incredible. Um, okay. developing and, and I wonder if there is, there's got to be some sort of, uh, family law classes or, or family law content that, that applies itself to that uh, CE credit for yeah. the, for the lawyers. Yeah. Um, I, there's just got to be. I'm so sure. I'll be interested I'll, to see what else I'll is out there. I'll look into it. I um, I've I have taken even though I don't need the CEU um credits. I have taken courses from colleagues on one recently was just division of community property. So, so that I'm aware of what the law is. I cannot give legal advice because I'm not an attorney, but I, I need to know what the law is. So I, you know, I can certainly, there's somebody I could certainly ask about that. I, you know, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. So I've got to be a little bit um, discreet, but yeah, let, let me look into that. And um, Nancy, how I, I want to, have folks easily connect with you uh, uh, right there on the screen. I know we've got the mediation around the table, but tell me a little bit about what you've put together there and kind of where is it? Or where are you on social media and website and just everything? So my website is just that mediationaroundthetable.com. And um, I have a Facebook page. I, I, I My Facebook page, I have a business page, Mediation Around the Table and a personal Nancy Gabriel. And I'm on LinkedIn as Nancy Gabriel. Um, that's about all the social media I do right now. But my website is the best place to start because you can contact me through there. You can read my blogs through there and, um, and you know, see where it goes from there. I I'll also be happy to share my phone number. It's sure. 702-561-8754. Say, say that again. Happy. I'm going to scribble it down on my notes as well. 702-561-8754. Okay. See, now people didn't have to rewind the there you go. podcast here any, any, any few minutes, but, or a few seconds. Um, Nancy's super good talking with you. Uh, let's continue the dialogue. Let's continue the introduction and the, um, the, the push into the powers that be. And, uh, Again, I'll, I'll finish with any introductions at all. Uh, don't hesitate a bit. Uh, shoot me over a text or, uh, you know, connection on right. social media or whatever. And guys, uh, everyone, you know, watching the podcast here, don't hesitate to uh, check out Nancy's content, uh, connect with her. If you're thinking about getting married, I, I think that's the number one best time to be reaching out and really engaging in these conversations and opening up your mind so you can have the very most successful relationship right. ever. Or um, even cohabitating. I've done cohabitation agreements for people that are just moving in together, um, specifically when they have kids, but even if they don't, just to set some expectations down on paper. So again, how do you get to those bodies early? What's the best way that we, you, your content, Rosalind's content, Kirsty Jane, everybody, how do we, that's what I kind of want to think about a lot. Uh, how do we keep pressing into those proactive areas, that yeah. proactive geography, that yeah. proactive formative age group? Yeah, I, I don't have an answer, Jeff. I, I wish I did. It's a great question. Well, let's keep asking it. And uh, anybody watching here, again, playing the social media game with the Deadbeat Chronicles page, guys, please uh, uh, like, comment on this video, subscribe to the channel. And um, if anyone's got any any comments or ideas, please don't hesitate. Even if you don't like us and you think we're full of crap, be nice. But um, 
any well, any, any suggestions many. on those introductions? Yeah, anybody watching here, any suggestions on the introductions with with those to those directions? So, thank you so much. Nancy, have a great rest of your day. Yeah, I'll talk to you very soon. And guys, Bye. everyone, love you. Have a great rest of your week. Take care. Bye-bye.